Thank you, David, and thank you one and all for joining us this evening for the gospel. And as David has already mentioned, I reiterate, we give you a very, very warm welcome in the name of the Lord. Now, it's morning time here in Australia, and I can I can tell you that Monday morning, the sun is going to shine. Um, this world will see another day. But the question upon our lips is this. Will you? God has spared me to see Monday morning. But you presently are on Sunday evening. None of us knows what a day may bring, may bring forth. And so we we take this gospel message with absolute seriousness in the sight of God, knowing that our time is limited and sin is serious. Judgment is real. Eternity is long. And we must face God. So with that little opening, let's turn to the Bible. If you have a Bible, I'm going to read three verses beginning at the first book in the Bible, Genesis, the Genesis record and the third chapter. Genesis chapter three, the first book in the Bible, chapter three and verse 19. Now, just to give you a little bit of context here, this is against the background of sin having entered into this world through the disobedience of one man, that is Adam. His wife, Eve, was deceived and she listened. She heeded to the voice of Satan. A, a, a great reality in this world today. And this man, Adam, was disobedient. And as a result of his disobedience, Death had entered in and God now is speaking to this couple and he is uh, rebuking them. And in verse 19, it reads this. In the sweat of thy faith, of thy face. In the sweat of thy face, shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And we trust that we will make that reading clear as we go along. Now, the second reading, uh, just taking it in order through the Bible, is in Ezekiel chapter 44. So come past Psalms and the Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, two quite large books, and you will find Ezekiel, and we want chapter 44. Ezekiel 44. We'll read in verse number 18. Ezekiel 44 and verse 18, and it reads, they shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches upon their loins they shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat finally in the new testament luke's record of the gospel matthew mark luke the third book in the new testament and the 20 22nd chapter luke chapter 22 Luke chapter 22, and we will read from verse 44, Luke 22 and verse 44, and it says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's evident, of course, that Every verse that we have read from contains something to do with sweating. In fact, the three verses that we have selected for the gospel preaching this afternoon are the only three verses in the entire Bible that speak about sweat. Rather interesting. And so I conclude with that simple fact that this is of great importance to God. And he only 
selectively uses this word and we want to think something of it and i trust that it will be a blessing to you as you listen to the gospel sweat sweating is a reality of life something that uh, we cannot escape though us would desire to in fact i was telling my wife uh, last night as i went to bed that uh, uh, with a reasonable amount of speaking engagements this morning uh, I, I i said to her i should put my jacket on so the audience maybe can't see the sweat patches as they appear under my armpits that might not be the nicest sight for you on a uh, a, a Sunday evening. It might not be the nicest for me on a on a Monday morning. But the reality is we sweat. There are apparently up to between two and four million sweat glands in the body in which we dwell. I remember on one occasion being in India. And in India uh, with two friends, we we desired to find the hottest curry in india we'd been traveling for some time this was a number of years ago about 20 20 plus years ago and uh, we we journeyed throughout that country in order to find the hottest curry and we tried this restaurant and that restaurant and the other restaurant and it wasn't until we were eating a curry and i don't know whether you've ever began to sweat upon the soles of your feet but i can tell you I think we found the hottest curry in India. We attempt to control our sweat. We put antiperspirant or deodorant on. And we, we desire to mask it. And at times, I guess, uh, it can be a bit of an issue. But I want to think about what the Bible says about sweat. We have read in Genesis about the entrance of sin into this world. And I want to think of how sin causes sweat. I guess, my friends, it may not be a bad thing if today, listening to the gospel, you begin just to sweat a little bit in the hot seat before God. You know, it's interesting when they uh, run a lie detector test, one of the uh, indicators of course is the uh, uh the body temperature and the the uh the ability or the the reality for the body to sweat and you and you begin to see an individual perspiring i know i've been in situations like that myself when out of nervousness or it feeling uncomfortable you begin to perspire well the gospel in the gospel we have to face stark issues realities we have to face ourselves in the light of god's word face the issue of sin the reality of god's judgment the fact that we will meet him and these kinds of issues and stark realities they cause us to sweat as we consider the seriousness of sin the eternal judgment that it has brought to each one of us but before this meeting is out, I want you to understand that there is somebody else who metaphorically has stepped into your shoes, but in reality has taken your place. And he sweat. That person is the Lord Jesus Christ, the great savior for humanity. The person who could be your savior today, he's my savior. And I commend him wholeheartedly to you. He is a savior well worth knowing and having. He saved me some 18 years ago. Blessed be his name. He can be your savior. But I want to think with you for a few moments what we read in Genesis. This man, Adam, had sinned against God and God had to remind him that as a result of his sin, life was now going to be difficult for him. I wonder if you consider 
the difficulty of your life. The intrusion of sin into this world and the difficulty that it brings into the lives of individuals. You think of how sin has ruined humanity. We look across this globe tonight and the very in the face of the pandemic that we're in the midst of. We can see that there is something grossly wrong. Something out of place. You and I look into our own lives and we can see that we are not right. The conscience, it, it knocks upon the door of the heart. Yelling at us that we're not right with God. The seriousness of sin. I wonder whether you've stopped to consider just how serious sin is. It's corrupted the mind. Our minds are twisted and warped in our thinking. You know, in the world in which we live, and maybe I'm speaking to you this evening and you can identify with this. The warped thinking of the mind. The moral compass within us is completely twisted. And we have come to accept that which is unnatural. You think of the world in which we live and what Hollywood promotes. Fornication and adultery. And all the sexual perversions of this world. That which is thought of possibly as normal twisted and warped and i know because i know myself that in the quietness of your own mind there are things that you wouldn't like anybody else to know we look around us at creation the bible tells us that when there is ample evidence for a creator we worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever when god gives us an understanding of himself just by the evidence of creation we turn away from him sin brings self-centeredness self-gratification self-reliance what a tragedy. And it has produced great difficulty. Just like the antiperspirant. As we try to mask our sweat, we try to mask the difficulty of sin. We try to turn away from acknowledging it. But, you know, my friends, if you're ever going to experience salvation from sin, if you're ever going to experience the forgiveness that God offers you through Christ, you will have to face your sin head on. Acknowledge it before God. It will only be through that that you are able to turn away from your sin. That is repentance. To completely change your mind. In relation to what previously you have considered yourself to be. I know what that's like for many years I buried my head in the sand of the reality of what I was as a sinner before God. Maybe imagining that if I did nothing about it, it would eventually disappear, only to realize that the difficulty and sorrow of sin seems to increase daily. This world degenerates. We're certainly not evolving. Sin has wrecked our world. It's introduced sorrow and sickness and suffering. Pollution and extinction brought the instability of extreme weather patterns and chaos. Oh, my friends, if you would just acknowledge your sin before God. It's tainted the universe. It's changed our eternal destiny. The verse which we read in Genesis. It said these words, till thou return to the ground. This man was going to experience the difficulty of life until eventually he would die. Sin brings death. 
of the sadness of that. It was never God's intention that we die. It was God's intention that we live in existence with him. We, we, we exist with him in fellowship, that we know what it is to, to dwell with our God and to worship him and love him and serve him and, and experience the joys of his presence. But sin has separated us from our God. It's brought in that distance, wrecked our world, and changed our eternity. Now we face death. I think of the tragedy. I have seven children. And you hold a little babe in your arms. And while there is much joy at the birth of a child, the reality is this. The horizon for that child is the grave. However long it lives, sin has brought death. Is there any hope for people in sin, in the difficulty of life? I'm so thankful to tell you on this gospel message, there is great hope. Hope, because into this world stepped a saviour. A saviour, Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ, a swear word to many. He is God's beloved son. My friends, just take hold of this for a minute. That the person who lived on planet Earth, 2,000 years ago and was taken outside the city walls of Jerusalem to be crucified upon a cross is none less than God's eternal son. He is the creator of the universe. He is the one who spoke to Adam in the garden and told him of the difficulty now that he was going to face in life with the sweat of his brow and that he would return to the grave. He, he would go to the grave. He would return, his body would return to dust. This same one stepped into our world to be our savior. And we read concerning him, listen, let me quote to you, being in an agony, his sweat was at, as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Why did the creator of this universe Step into this world to experience what it was to sweat in agony. Could I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, friends, boys and girls, he came to be our savior. He came to taste death on our behalf. He came to accept the judgment of God that you and I deserve because of our sin. That's the reality. What a savior. Who do you know that would step into your place and bear the judgment that you deserve because of sin? I tell you, my friends, the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is well worth knowing. He destroyed, he defeated death upon the cross 2,000 years ago. God judged his son, that he may never judge you in eternity, that you may go free. Think of this with me for a moment. The heavenly creator, the creator of the universe, came into this world, one who was ever present to help others, himself, placed himself in a position of, helplessness the one who in eternity knew bliss placed himself in the reality of agony it's unfathomable what it was to christ to bear the judgment for our sin the unrelenting unmitigated wrath of god that I was deserving of and that you are deserving of as being perpetrators of sin. He bore, listen, my friends, he bore our sins 
in his own body on the tree. He came to be the sin bearer. He came to be the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He came to take my place as a substitute, willingly, the Lamb of God, that he might take the judgment that I deserve. He might bear the judgment that you deserve because of sin. But it caused him to sweat unfathomable agony. We cannot conceive what it was for him to go through. The agony of the cross. But I'm thankful to tell you, my friends, that Jesus Christ, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. He has he has defeated death, defeated the grave. It's powerless against him now. He surrendered himself to the place of judgment to accept the judgment from God on our behalf because of our sin and entered into the reality of death. But oh, my friend, this was the man who could say these words. No man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. And on the third day, he rose triumphant from the grave, conquering death, tearing the bars away, rising out from the darkness of the tomb to give life to all that would come to him by faith. Would you like to know what it is to dwell with Christ for eternity without the sorrow of sin? Without judgment, you know, there's a the Bible speaks of a man in the same record that we we read Luke's record of the gospel in chapter 16. Who died in rejection of God and God's provision of salvation. And the Bible says in hell, he lift up his eyes in that place. He spoke these words, he said, concerning a beggar that used to sit at his gate, who was now in the eternal bliss. He said, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Oh, the tragedy to reject Christ and leave this world and bear the sorrow of judgment. For eternity, the torment of the lake of fire. Heat causes us to sweat. This man was in the torment of the flame because he rejected God's offer. Can I ask you, my friend, on this call from Australia? Would you take Jesus Christ personally as your savior? Just accept him by faith. God's word that we've read from promises you everlasting life. You turn from your sin. Accept by faith Christ. I well remember 18 years ago at the side of a road calling out to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. True to his word, he saved my poor lost soul. True to his word, he will do the same for you. Just as you are there, maybe in your bedroom, in your living room, wherever it may be, sitting at the kitchen table, walking the street, listening to this call, he will save you too. He who bore the agony of the cross. He who had the power to destroy, to disannul, to render idle the great power of death that grips you, that you can do nothing about. He has had power over it. He has risen triumphant from it. 
He can liberate you. He can give you everlasting life. Trust him. Cry to him. Finally, we read in Ezekiel about a day when there will be no more sweat in the context of sin. Blessed hope for every believer in Jesus Christ. Blessed hope for every Christian. Can I ask you, do you have that hope? Do you know what it is to have the forgiveness of sin? Do you have eternal life? You can do. You see, listen to this verse. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you shall confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The blessed reality, salvation, saved, forgiven, restored in your relationship to God. Eternal life. And to dwell one day. In the universe of bliss with God himself. A world. Where there will be no more sin. No more sorrow. No more suffering. No more sickness. No more sweat. Where are you presently? Where are you in relation to God? Where are you in relation to salvation? These issues are real, my friend. We're going to close. There is something within me that would love to reach through this screen and embrace you. And pull you in. Just to to reiterate to you the solemnity, the seriousness of sin. Where it's taking you for eternity, separated from God, death, not only physical, but ultimately eternal death. Oh, but there's a savior, a savior who can rescue you, who can restore you, who can give you eternal life, who can translate you into the world of bliss. When God wraps up the ages of time and opens the door for eternity, you could be with him, with Christ, enjoying the bliss of eternal glory, sin forgiven, sin put away. You could experience that if you trust Christ just now. I close, my friend, with this precious verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved.